have you turn to the book of James. If you're using a pew Bible, it's page 1386. 1,386 in the Pew Bibles. I'll read the text in just a few moments, but uh, let's begin with prayer this morning. Our Father, we are thankful for that great day that we anticipate when you will bring us all safely home. And we do pray, Father, that you would prepare our souls for that day, that you would bring sinners to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you would preserve and encourage the saints, Lord, as we continue in this world with tribulation. And Father, that you would help us to persevere, that you would sustain us all the way to the end. Lord, we ask with especially whatever it is that we might have on on our plates right now these days, whatever difficulties we might be facing, Lord, that you would use James to minister to our hearts here today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we began our study on the book of James last week, where I mentioned to you that this book was likely written by James, the brother of Jesus, This is the James who was dubbed James the Just by the historian Hegesippus because of his righteousness and his prayer life. And he's the James who became the prominent pastor in Jerusalem in the book of Acts, the one who was one of the leaders of the council called in Acts chapter 15. And as we track through his life last week, We saw that um, if indeed this is the James who wrote the book, and and this is traditionally what is understood to be the case, then this is a James, the brother of Jesus, who didn't believe in Christ in his younger days, even though he would have grown up in the household and been closer to Christ in some ways, at least as far as geographical proximity and perhaps brotherly relationship than many people. But James rather seems to have been converted after the death of Christ, when Jesus went to see him. And James, if you remember, was specifically mentioned as one that Jesus went to see after the resurrection. Now, if James was not technically an apostle, he was recognized as having a similar authority and ministry. The book of James, as we saw last week, was probably written between the 40s, A.D. 40s somewhere, and 62 when James was martyred. So many people think that uh, right before the Jerusalem Council in A.D. 49 seems to be a a time period that would make sense, especially when you see the kinds of things James talks about and some of the things that that he doesn't. But um, you have to hold some of these things loosely where James is concerned. One of the things that can be helpful to understand that we drew out once already is that James seems to be quite familiar with the teaching of Christ, and you'll see parallels between what James teaches and the teaching of Christ, for instance, like on the Sermon on the Mount. There also is almost a a Proverbs-type element to his book, where instead of introducing a topic and thoroughly developing it, He might introduce a topic, talk about it a little bit, go on to another one, and then eventually cycle back to that original topic. And so in that way, his book almost comes across more like wisdom literature, like the book of Proverbs. So this morning, um, instead of, for instance, looking at verses 2 all the way up through 8 or even farther, um, we're going to take what I think is probably his first little Proverbs-like section from verses 2 through 4. And then, uh, depending on your Bible, you might actually have a break there, or some of you might continue on with the same paragraph. But there is a shift in verse 5, shifting from uh, joy and trials to the need for us to pray for wisdom and how we should pray in that way. So they're related topics, but they are different as well. Follow along. I'm going to start with verse 1, and this morning we're just going to read up to verse 4. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. One of the first things we need to understand in the book of James and in this text is the context. We saw last time that the recipients of this book were Jewish believers who were scattered throughout the world, living away from Jerusalem, living away from the land of Israel, and he particularly was focused on them. Think with me for a minute about Jewish history. You have the deportation of the northern tribes of Israel to Assyria in the Old Testament recorded for us. Then later, you have the deportation of the southern kingdom of Judah to Babylon. And so you have in their very history, Jews who were scattered throughout various places away from their homeland, the land that God had given to Abraham. By the time you get to James' life, for instance, in Acts chapter 2, at the day of Pentecost, where people had gathered for that feast, Luke records that Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, came to Jerusalem for that feast of Pentecost. In fact, listen a little farther in Acts chapter 2. Listen, now this is where they're being confused because they're hearing what's being said in their own languages and there is the miracle of tongues there at Pentecost. But listen, normally we're thinking about the miracle of hearing their own languages, but I want you to listen to the variety that's here where all of these Jews had come from. Picking it up in the middle of that account, and how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Remember, many of these Jews had been in those other places since birth and their parents and hundreds of years back. Even though they continued to maintain an identity as Jews, they had grown up in a foreign land. They never, some of them never had lived in Jerusalem. So after asking that question, then here's the list. Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. <laughs> so there's your list of Jews that had gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost from all of these different nations and languages. Now we know that at Pentecost, Many Jews heard the gospel, believed, and returned home as Jesus followers. Now then when you get to the time of James uh, living there, and that's similar time there as Pentecost, you know, the early days after Christ's ascension, you did have some believers who were there um, living in Jerusalem who had been there for their entire lives, but even some of them during the time of James ended up scattered, remember? So you already have a historical dispersion of, of all kinds of Jews that over time had been spread throughout the nations, but then even during the time of James, you had those living in Jerusalem who were persecuted and then scattered after the martyrdom of Stephen. So whether it was recent or more historical, for various reasons, there were Christian Jews living all throughout the known world now, especially after the, the series of events and early acts, living all throughout the known world, and yet often, even after decades and centuries go by, often as foreigners or outsiders. Some of you are familiar with the history of certain countries where you have certain people groups who have been in that country for centuries, and because of who they are and perhaps being in the minority, those people groups are still considered to be on the outside, 
even though they've grown up in that country. And I think it was like that with the Jews who may have grown up in some of these other countries, parts of Africa, parts of the Roman kingdom, you know, different languages, lots of different nations, and they may have grown their entire lives and maybe several generations back they could trace, and yet they were still Jews who often were not really received in the same way as the majority in that population. Oh, I mentioned last week, and I believe that the book of James is applicable to Gentiles, but it's clear that James has a heart to minister to the diaspora, to the scattered Jews. It would be similar to Paul writing to the Romans. You know, the Romans were the recipients of that book, but Paul's instruction was binding with apostolic authority for every believer. So while James is writing the scattered Jews, and some of what he says is somewhat particular to their situation, what he wrote did carry an authority to all believers, even though those things are, are true. Think about some of the hardships that would come from living in a land that was somebody else's land, somebody else's country. Even if you had lived there for generations, because you were Jewish in this case, you simply were not received like the others. And after Pentecost, some may have been quite recently driven from their homes. And in that case, they would especially be struggling probably with things like language and culture and just not knowing. By the way, if you've ever, if you've ever done a study throughout Scripture about groups that are considered to be vulnerable groups that can be easily oppressed, there are several major categories that rise to the surface quite quickly. Widows and orphans, of course. Widows and orphans are categories of people in the Word of God that are considered to be at risk or vulnerable, that are often oppressed by others more powerful. But there are other categories in the Bible like that as well. I chuckled at one point because it seemed like ministers were actually considered to be sometimes in that category. But so are foreigners. Foreigners are often considered to be in that category of being vulnerable. And if you've ever traveled abroad, you can understand that. I've said before, I think everyone should try to take the opportunity at some point to become a minority, at least for a trip. I remember when Pastor John and I went to China on a number of occasions, and I actually went with my wife as well when we adopted Jenea, and um, to, to be in a land where there's just a sea of thousands and thousands of, of Asians who speak a different language and have a different culture, and they kind of know how that subway thing works and all that, and here I'm coming not only from the States, but from the sticks. And I come to a city like Beijing. So it's not only foreign and it's in being a country, it's foreign because it's a huge city. And I didn't grow up in a huge city. And there's just so many things about it that are fascinating and terrifying at the same time. And you could see where, man, you could so easily be taken advantage of. There was, uh, I think it was when Pastor John, was that taxi? That, that was you. We, so we got off the airport, and uh, it's, it's helpful when you know people on the other side who can help you navigate some of this, but if you don't. So we didn't know. Um, we, got, we got off in you know, the airport, walked out, you know, ready to go, and I think we ended up in a taxi that probably wasn't recognized officially as you know, a taxi that was approved. And uh, it seems to me, if you, if, I don't know if you remember, John, but it seems like he actually took us off away from the airport and then wanted to start haggling a price after we had been taken away and had no other options and realized something's not right here. And he wanted to really get more out of us, especially we were talking with Rachel Heffield at the time who lived over there. And she would tell us, you know, about how much you should pay for a trip like that. And this guy was wanting a lot more than that. And yet here we were, away from the airport, but a long way from our destination, not really knowing or understanding a lot of what's going on and uh, trying with our English to connect with him and say, no, we're not going to pay what you're asking. That's ridiculous. At least that's what we've been told. 
So it's a challenge when you're the foreigner, when you're the minority, and you're struggling in a place where you're outnumbered, and you don't have the power in the situation, you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the language, and you don't know the customs. So imagine some of these Jews, especially, who maybe had just been scattered after the persecution of Stephen, and you're struggling just in some cases, even if there were universal languages, you know, that were common and yeah, throughout some of the trade routes and stuff. Still, I mean, oftentimes you end up struggling with what people are saying and why things are done the way that they are, and it's easy to be taken advantage of, just like Pastor John and me with that taxi. Because you can't communicate well, and you just don't really know what's going on, and you're a little bit you know, off your game because you don't know. You don't, especially if you don't have people advocating for you or standing up for you that know the situation. You're vulnerable. Now, specifically, we're going to get to this in a few weeks, but part of the context here is in James 2, verses 5 through 7. And we'll get to this, but I just want to show you this passage because it plays into the current text when you look at the kinds of tribulations people might have been going through. James 2, 5, Listen, my beloved brethren, Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Now, if you look at the whole counsel of God, we are taught that it is not innately sinful to be wealthy but it is dangerous. There are dangers that come with wealth, but frankly, there are dangers that come with poverty as well. We have certain proclivities to sin when we have stuff, and we have certain proclivities to sin when we don't have stuff. So it's not sinful just to have wealth. There were men of God in the and women in the scriptures that had a lot. People like Abraham, people like Lydia, people of means. The big question is, are we trusting in those riches and what are we doing with those riches for the kingdom? But it's not innately sinful to be rich. But the context of James is that so many of the people that he was writing to were poor. And in this context, many of the people around them who had money were oppressing them. And hasn't that often been the story of history? where the people who have the power tend to take advantage of the people who don't because they can. People who have money, oftentimes, if they're living sinfully and selfishly, will take advantage of people who don't have money because they can. Now, I'm not proposing class warfare. I'm not saying that people who have means are innately wrong or or wicked. But let's be candid. There are times when we are sinful and selfish in our hearts We use whatever we have to our advantage in a way that often doesn't bring glory to God. It could be money, it could be looks or athletic ability. So in the context of the book of James, there were many believers who were being oppressed because they were poor by ungodly rich people, but it also seems there's indication, and we'll find out more later on as we get there, there seems to be indication that sometimes, even perhaps amongst the believing community, there was a temptation that when you got more stuff, you started acting the same way. And so Paul has something to say to, to all of us about how we use our wealth. But in that, in that example, though, he says to them, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? So apparently, In the context of many of those um, that James was writing, it was common for the wealthy to drag the poor into the courts to take advantage of them. And in the process, sometimes they would even blaspheme the name of Jesus in their attacks against the Christian poor. And James wants the Jews to have nothing to do with that sinful attitude even as they themselves perhaps gain wealth and power as they conduct business or work hard. So it's in that context then 
that James brings this instruction. So first you have this, I guess we could call it a command there in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials or when you meet trials of various kinds. Now some people might think James is being unrealistic or out of touch. After all, he lives in Jerusalem as a respected pastor, and maybe he just doesn't get what it's like to to live as a Jew in a foreign land. So what does he know? But think about it. (laughs) What had James himself experienced? He had experienced the death of Stephen at the hands of the wicked Jews in Jerusalem. Not that long after Jesus himself had been crucified. The church in Jerusalem, after the death of Stephen, was being persecuted. And that's why the saints were scattering at that point. They were scattering. At one point, we're told, pretty much everyone except the apostles was scattering because of the persecution. Acts 8 Verse 1, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Now, I don't know that it matters whether it was You know, if James was writing this closer to the time, not too far after Jesus had ascended, or a few years later, you don't forget this kind of stuff. And sometimes it's easy for us to think about the people in the Bible in a little bit of a storybook way, like a cold, calculated way. But think with your heart for a minute about what James had been through. Imagine, think about our own congregation here. Look around. Think about those who are here this morning. Some of you are here. Some of you are visiting. But what a, what a beautiful group of people we have worshiping the Lord together here this morning. Now imagine that in one year from today, 75% of you were gone because of persecution and one of our own had been killed for his faith. What would that be like for the rest of us, 25% who are left to process? Three quarters gone because of persecution and the death of someone we all knew and loved. James knew what it meant to suffer for the sake of Christ, even though he still remained in Jerusalem. So it's in love and with great understanding and pastoral heart that James calls his readers brothers, and the implication with that word really is brothers and sisters. It can encompass all. Brothers and sisters, he was putting himself really at the same level of them. We are brothers and sisters in Christ together, and he's encouraging encouraging them to trust Jesus in these things. So he says, count it all joy my brothers and sisters. Now, what does that actually mean? I find myself asking that a lot, especially when I'm coming through, going through James. I have a lot of issues with James, and I'm kind of thankful to be preaching through the book because I'm hoping to answer a few of my own issues. Well, what does it mean to count it all joy? You know, there were a lot of songs written in the last century in the Christian church for Sunday school and for worship, some of the songs from the gospel era, and some of them almost gave me the idea that, you know, if you're a Christian, then it's just joy all the time. Joy, joy, happy face. If you really know Jesus, it's joy, true joy, nothing but joy. And there were a lot of songs like that. And, and there was a partial truth to it, but also a little bit of a misleading emptiness to it when you think about the tribulations that we're actually called to go through. You know, songs that just didn't match with Jesus' teaching that in this world you will have tribulation. So James is not saying to put on a happy face. Pretend your trial is not really a trial at all. You know, you can start doing mental gymnastics like that, right? 
Oh, if you think about your trial and you compare it with all the other trials from the other people and the other Christians and other places, then you'll find that by comparison, your trial is just not that big. There might be some truth to that. But that's not what James is saying. Kids, can you finish the rest of this? This is for anybody 18 and younger. Turn that frown. Yeah. <laughs> is that what James is saying? Turn that frown upside down. No, James is a man who knew persecution. He knew devastation. He knew death for the sake of Christ. And he was a man who'd be facing his own martyrdom because he was a Christ follower. So what James is saying here, when he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, he's talking about an active exercise in faith to deliberately and intentionally place this category or this trial in the category of pure joy, nothing but joy because of the work that God is doing in us, because of the goodness and the love of God in times like this. He says, you will fall into trials of all kinds. You will often find yourself surrounded by troubles of all kinds. And, and I think in this case, trial can be distinguished from temptation, with trials coming to us from the outside and temptations often rising from within. So James is talking about persecution. He's talking about rich people dragging poor Jews into court to extort money from them simply because they can He's talking about suffering for the cause of Christ or just suffering in this life, but largely from the things that come from the outside and weigh upon us. Maybe for someone it might be losing your job because you're a believer. Or not getting housing because the locals don't want you in their neighborhood. Or having the rich take you to court and winning because they have the money, the power, and the local relationships to pull that off. So why would you count this kind of stuff as pure joy? Well, I think you see the motivation there in verse 3. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, or steadfastness, or perseverance. James doesn't always elaborate in a lot of detail, but you can tell that he had heard Christ teach. And his teaching on this is right in line with Jesus and the apostles. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew, 11, or Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12, and many of you are familiar with this, I'm sure. Blessed are you, Jesus said, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, so Jesus gives us a little glimpse and how can we rejoice and be exceeding glad? Because I am Christ's. Because I'm headed toward heaven. A few more years shall roll. A few more Sabbaths here and we will be on that eternal shore. I am headed toward glory. Great is your reward in heaven. So if I maintain an eternal perspective and a heavenly perspective, I remember that I have cause to rejoice because this is not all there is. And there's something coming that is glorious and that is forever. And I'm also identified with the prophets who were faithful ministers of God prior. What about Paul? Paul in Romans 5, starting with verse 3, teaches the same thing. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character, and character hope. So Paul teaches us that trials are related to our maturity 
and ultimately our hope in Jesus Christ. Peter, the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 1, verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice. Isn't that interesting? James, Jesus, Peter, Paul, all teach us to rejoice in tribulation. It's a significant New Testament doctrine. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, Peter writes. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So you look at all of this, James, Jesus, Paul, Peter, and they all are telling us to rejoice in trials because of my attachment to the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise that he who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it, and the prospect of an eternity with no more tribulation. But the forever worshiping of our King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what's interesting is it is so clear when you look at the evidence from Scripture that God wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. He's doing a work in us that's not just preserving us until glory, but is actually making us more like Jesus, causing us to grow up in Christ, causing us to mature as the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes to fruition in our lives. So there is a, refi a refining process of trials designed to purify our faith from sin and cultivate our faith and hope in Christ. James says, we know, we have experiential knowledge as we walk with Jesus that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness or perseverance. So James wants us to actively exercise faith in Jesus as these trials come. We're reminded that God is continuing that good work, that God is present in the trials, working them for a greater purpose including our own good. And we're reminded of the glory to come. I wasn't able to be in Sunday school because I was teaching the, the, the membership class, um, but I briefly heard that it was very related to what we're talking about here this morning. Some of the purposes that God has in persecution or in dark providence, God does have a purpose in them, and He is bringing those things to pass in our lives. And a lot of the growth that happens in us just wouldn't happen without the heat of those trials. I don't think James is teaching us to love pain, but he's teaching us to trust Christ in the pain. He's not teaching us to call evil good, but he's teaching us to follow a good Savior when we're being affected by the evil. Kistemaker says this, Some people think that because they are unable to avoid trying circumstances, they should resign themselves to them. I guess I would call that fatalism. They adopt the slogan, whatever will be, will be. But whereas resignation is passive, perseverance is active. Resignation results in defeat, perseverance in triumph. The Christian perseveres by looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of his faith. That quote was convicting to me. Especially in my own chronic fight with Lyme disease. There have been many times in that battle, far too often, that I've been tempted toward passive resignation instead of active perseverance. 
this is the way it is. There's not a lot I can do about it, so whatever. <laughs> when I should have been grabbing a hold of the Lord Jesus Christ and his promises and his goodness by faith, trusting what the word says about me and those trials. So it was a real blessing to read from the Heidelberg Catechism this week. If you ever want a blessing from a historic church document, read the Heidelberg Catechism. Here's question 27. What do you understand by the providence of God? Answer, God's providence is his almighty and ever-present power, whereby, as with his hand, he still upholds heaven and earth and all creatures, and so governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, health and sickness, Riches and poverty, indeed all things, come to us, not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need to get a hold of that truth. We need to live our lives in light of that truth. All of those things, good and bad, come to us, not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. Actually, the next question, question 28, says, what does it benefit us to know that God has created all things and still upholds them by his providence? Answer, we can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and with a view to the future, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature shall separate us from his love for all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they cannot so much as move. And if you're interested, you can look this up online. There's a whole host of scripture passages that you can explore that go with those questions and answers. All things, brothers and sisters, come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. But you know, we have to believe that by faith because our tribulations look a whole lot like everybody else's tribulations. And it's by faith we understand what the Bible says and promises us about these things, that for the believer, this always is coming from the loving hand of a heavenly father. So James says the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So we have the command and the motivation, and I think there's a goal mentioned for us there in verse 4. The command, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The motivation, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The goal, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, or mature and complete. This reflects the teaching of Jesus to his disciples in Matthew 10, 22. He says, and you will be hated for all or by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Not that we'll be saved by our own perseverance, but our perseverance will give evidence of our genuine faith. Just like when we quoted Peter earlier, and he says that the tribulation shows our faith to be genuine. This perseverance or steadfastness will have its full effect or it will finish its work, making me mature. The word perfect there doesn't mean sinless, but rather mature. It it will make me mature. It will make me complete or whole. Those are the, the two words that James uses, that we might be perfect or mature and complete or whole, lacking nothing. So here I think is the idea. God's grace will be developing the character of Christ in me while cleansing me of unrighteousness and faithlessness. God's work will bring me to a measure of maturity and trust in my walk with Jesus in the midst of those tribulations. And instead of having gaping holes in my life and testimony, As that steadfastness does its work, as I fasten my gaze upon Christ walking through those trials, there will be a wholeness 
a consistency, an integrity in the way that I live, and even in how I think about God and His promises. You know, ideally, as you and I grow, as we learn, as we mature, it doesn't take quite as long to come back to the promises of God. We're not as far away from some of the good truths of Scripture that maybe earlier in our Christian lives we feel. And if we are, we know where to come back and find those promises, don't we? So let's say you lose your job because of your Christian beliefs. It certainly will not be without its stress, but if I am maturing and developing wholeness in Christ, then I will exhibit a Holy Spirit-produced prayerfulness, thankfulness, and faith in the midst of that tribulation. I will have the courage and the boldness to stand for the truth but the wisdom and grace not to be a jerk about it. It's Christian maturity. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's wholeness. It's the work being completed. So if I lose my job because of my Christian beliefs, and I get to a certain point of maturity in Christ, not that I won't struggle with any of that, but my main priority will remain the glory of Jesus even while I'm suffering. I will seek to make His name great in this. And certainly these things are not going to be done in perfection. We still struggle even as we get older. We have remaining sin and we have remaining doubts and issues, but maybe it takes us a little less time and a little less distance to come back to the things that we know and live in light of those things. And God works in us a maturity and a measure of consistency. Now, it doesn't always go this way, does it? There is an alternative, and it's not a good one. The alternative to exercising faith in God in tribulation is to respond to trials without faith and praise to God, without counting it pure joy because of the work that God is doing in my life, You know what that result ends up looking like? Bitterness, cynicism, depression. And it happens that way too sometimes, doesn't it? What James is calling us to is a deliberate exercising of faith in times of trial. Not putting on a happy face when you're sad, not turning the frown upside down, and not just a fatalistic, well, this is just the way it is kind of a mentality, but grabbing a hold of the Lord Jesus Christ and His promises and His faithfulness and looking to the author of our faith and seeking to exalt His name even in that tribulation. So brothers and sisters, James is calling us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials because Jesus is still on the throne and God continues the work that He has begun in us. For those of you who don't know Christ, this kind of thing is going to seem pretty foreign for you to think about Jesus in a really bad time. And you're going to find that without Christ, a lot of this kind of outward tribulation, which we all... Some of it's coming our way, no matter whether we know the Lord or not. I mean, sometimes we might get tribulation because we know the Lord. But we're all going to suffer, struggle, living in a fallen and broken world. But if you're trying to do that in your own strength and with your own relationship with God broken, you're going to struggle even more because not only are you fighting the situation, you're fighting your Creator. You're at odds with the one who made you. So you're going to struggle. Because you don't have any real answers and you don't really have any purpose outside of yourself to handle this. I would, in, I would exhort you, I would encourage you, I would urge you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on Him. Ask Him to cleanse you of your sin and to help you with these tribulations in this, in this life. That He would give you a sense of purpose and meaning that however difficult things may be, you know that you're His and you know where you're heading, but that can only be said of one who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. So come to Him. 
we're certainly not saying your life is going to get totally better if you come to Christ. In fact, in some ways, Jesus is the one who tells us there's going to be trouble following after him. But what we're also taught is that it's worth it. And we have a future that's assured with none of those tribulations anymore. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for this passage, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this teaching and pray now for your help and your grace in putting it into practice in our lives. Lord, that you would make us men and women of faith and faithfulness, that we would persevere not just by gritting our teeth and bearing it, but Lord, we would persevere by fixing our eyes on Christ and living our lives for his glory. And Lord, be merciful to those who don't know Jesus. Show them the futility of life without Christ and how the end is death for those who continue in rebellion against him. Lord, be merciful and and save many for your great name's sake. Show them the futility of continuing on in animosity against you. Break their hearts, Lord. Show them their sin and bring them to Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.